China and India work to reset relations strained by border disputes and trade tensions. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi welcomed Chinese President Xi Jinping to the southern Indian coastal town of Mamalapuram over the weekend. This was the second informal summit for the leaders who had candid conversations, reportedly lasting over five hours. President Xi and Prime Minister Modi discussed improving bilateral relations, boosting economic ties, and tackling India's trade deficit. The meeting comes just days after Beijing hosted Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan for an official visit. For more now on China's role in South Asia, let's bring in our panel. Joining us here in the studio is Southern Andume. He's a research fellow with the American Enterprise Institute and South Asia columnist for the Wall Street Journal. From Islamabad, Musharraf Saidi is the former principal advisor to Pakistan's foreign minister. From Beijing, Shindo Shu is a senior fellow with the Pangol Institution. And James Schweinlein is a non-resident scholar in the South Asia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Thank you to all of you for being with us. Salanan, this was the second informal summit. It was quick. I think the whole visit lasted about 24 hours. Many issues on the table. Um, the border dispute between the two countries, the situation in Kashmir, the trade deficit. Uh, what do you think the summit achieved? I actually don't think they were, at least according to the readout, I don't think Kashmir was on the table so much. It was mostly no, about... No, but it is an issue between it the is, countries. They did it not discuss about it, this, you're right. At yeah. the summit, yeah. just, just, just on the technicality there. Um, you know, the, what's happening with these informal summits, you had one uh, in Wuhan uh, last year, and, and you, had this, you had this one. And what is going on is that the Indians and the Chinese are trying to establish a relationship between the two top leaders, Xi Jinping and Modi, recognizing that there are many bilateral disputes that the two countries have and trying to ensure that these don't get out of hand. So uh, how far did they go in, in achieving this? So there's this very goal? little in terms of what we, what, in terms of things that are, con in terms of concrete outcomes. What we got were atmospherics. What we got yeah. were very positive photo ops. We saw uh, Modi and Xi Jinping sitting side by side, sipping right. coconut water from a coconut and wandering around the temple and that sort of thing. So the atmospherics uh, right. were positive. Uh, if you actually look for substance, you don't really find too much over there. Right. But I think they would argue that the purpose of, the, of these informal yeah. summits, that's why they're called informal. Right. It's not to generate substance. So uh, what's the point of the, the personal meeting, the one-on-one? -on -one? What does that do? I think what they're trying to do is recognize that if they can break away from the bureaucratic systems that both countries have, yeah. that they'll be able to unlock some of these thorny issues. For example, the trade deficit is something that <coughs> India sort of uh, cares about a lot. The two countries have a boundary dispute, which is longstanding and unresolved. Uh, the issue of Kashmir and China's relationship with Pakistan is another thing that has come up. So these things sort of come up over and over, and the feeling is that if they go through the normal channels of the mm -hmm. bureaucracy and the sort of foreign policy uh, set up, they are not as amenable to being, f to being fixed. So for example, Indian, the Indian media is reporting that India may be uh, ready to sign on to RCEP, the trade agreement that's going on, which is led by China in East Asia. And these are the kinds of things where they feel that at the head of government level, that's easier to get a breakthrough than by working through normal channels. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to RCEP a little later in the show, but let me go to Shindo Xu. He is uh, in Beijing. Shindo, uh, according to some reports, this was a meeting that almost never took place. It was some time before President Xi confirmed that he was actually visiting India. What was in it for China? Well, uh, I, just as the previous guest has mentioned, this is an informal summit. It is not uh, targeting at uh, producing, say, signing agreements between the two sides. It's really about um, for the top leadership to strengthen their understanding, to give them some room, private room for them to exchange some true ideas, their understanding of the relationship, their understanding of the regional and the global affairs, so they can share their understanding and to build trust from the top. And then they can uh, give some uh, direction and they can give some uh, guidance uh, for how to develop, uh, for both sides, how to develop their relationship, uh, you know, and how to manage their differences, uh, prevent the differences from becoming problems. And then beyond that, how to further their relationship uh, for the benefits of both sides. 
Musharraf Zaidi, this uh, meeting between uh, Prime Minister Modi and President Xi Jinping took place just days after the Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan went to Beijing on an official visit. What do you make of the juxtaposition of these meetings? Was there a message somewhere in there? I think the, there's a message if Pakistan is willing to receive it, and, and the message is the same one that China has been trying to convince Pakistan of and communicate to Pakistan and with Pakistan. But unlike a lot of other countries, uh, the way in which China communicates with Pakistan is both uh, very formally, uh, privately, uh, and also informally, and it's always about what is in Pakistan's best interests. The message from the China-India dynamic that China wants Pakistan to learn, or the lesson that China wants Pakistan to learn, is that the foundation of the national project has to be <clears throat> the economic well-being of the people of the country. And if, uh, if you look at the growth in bilateral trade between China and India, it's gone from roughly two and a half or three billion dollars at the turn of the century in, in 2001. Uh, it grew dramatically. It grew by almost five and a half or six times by about 2008. And then it grew another four times since then. So today, bilateral trade is in the neighborhood of 75 to 80 billion U.S. dollars. That's almost three and a half to four times the total uh, exports that Pakistan has. That's just the quantum of trade between China and India. So it's large, it's grown very fast, and it's really helped to forge some normalcy between what are otherwise strategic competitors. And so what Pakistan should be uh, gleaning from this, in China's view, is that whilst Pakistan may have other issues with India, it must seek uh, pathways and avenues to engage India in bilateral trade that is mutually beneficial for both countries. Now, to what extent is India willing to play ball is, is a separate conversation, but I think that's what the message always has been with regards to China and what it's trying to communicate to Pakistan, and that's certainly what I would glean from the timing of these uh, specific meetings last week. James, uh, Musharraf was just talking about bilateral trade relations between the two countries. Uh, China is India's second biggest trading partner. Current two-way trade is worth $87 billion, but India is running uh, a deficit, a uh, $53 billion deficit with China. This is what the Indian Foreign Minister had to say on that particular issue. Let's watch this. There was a good conversation on trade. As you know, this is an issue which has been of concern here back home. And President Xi Jinping, after hearing out our Prime Minister on this issue, said that, he, that China is ready to take sincere action in this regard and to discuss in a very concrete way how to reduce the trade deficit. So James, the two sides did agree to set up some kind of mechanism to reduce that trade deficit. How significant is this? Well, I think the first thing to contrast is the uh, this summit and the previous China-India in, informal summit at Wuhan. Um, there was no Wuhan spirit from this summit. There was no hype. Neither side was pushing this out um, as a major transformational moment. I'd contrast the context. Uh, Wuhan was preceded by a major bilateral dispute. This was not. This is, there is latent tension, uh, as Musharraf was saying a moment ago, um, between India and China. Um, they, are, they are rivals, in a, growing rivals in Asia. Uh, but there was no moment of crisis that was trying to be addressed here. On the economic side, I think the, the point here is that China is trying to intermediate its relationships um, on multiple levels with multiple different partners around the world. And it's doing so in a familiar, with a familiar playbook. It, uh, really, it tends to push towards process. It tends to slow the conversation down. Meanwhile, as you say, the terms of trade remain heavily weighted in, in, in China's favor. Um, and partners struggle to interact with it. Um, look at the current US-India, uh, US-China trade dispute yeah. uh, that, that is going on. It's a familiar picture. The China-EU trade, uh, trade relationship is very similar. Um, India has not yet broken out of the box, the broken, out of, broken out of the trap <coughs> that many trading partners uh, feel, with, uh, feel with China today. So fair to say then, James, that the Chinese foreign policy is in large measure driven by its trade relationship with countries? Uh, I would say uh, chi China's external uh, uh, policy, yeah. and I would di uh, differ from the word foreign policy, yeah. its external policy is uh, directed towards its internal economic development. Um, and that, that is not, uh, whether that internal economic development 
uh, requires China to become you know, a latent security provider or, any, or take on the rules uh, of glo uh, governing the, or the rules or roles of the yeah. United States in, in the global security environment in the future, I think is, is being tested today um, in places like the South China Sea and elsewhere. Right. Um, but the, uh, whether China's ultimate intent is to, uh, to push, use its economic policy as an instrument of what, what in the West we would think of as traditional national security policy, I think is, uh, is unclear. What, uh, on the other side, on the Indian side of this equation, I think uh, as Sadhanan said a moment ago, um, India is, is clearly trying to uh, negotiate a personal relationship with President Xi, the principal yeah. decision maker on the Chinese side, in the attempt of, uh, hope, uh, of using China to put pressure on Pakistan to resolve other uh, regional tensions, or at least to reduce the scope of, of, the, uh, of China's kind of support for uh, antagonists against India's rise. Southern, there is one view of the China-India relationship, and that is that China would like to see India uh, or slow India's you know, burgeoning relationship with the United States, uh, perhaps create a more Asian relationship between those two countries. Uh, do you see that happening? I think that's a sort of constant triangle, right? Yeah. Now, on the one hand, the U.S. would want India to be a pivotal partner in the Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, given the India's size, given its landmass, uh, and so on, given the fact that it's, uh, it has a democratic system. And I think it's in China's interest uh, to ensure that the U.S.-India relationship, which is very close, uh, does not become even closer and more formalized. So, for example, one of the concerns that the Chinese often raise is India's participation in the Quad, which is a grouping of the, you know, the U.S., India, Japan, and Australia. So there's this constant sort of, you know, back and forth that goes on. From an Indian perspective, you know, the way they, they sort of see this is that, look, China is a reality. China has grown much more powerful, not only in the broader region, but particularly in the South Asian neighborhood. You saw the President Xi Jinping straight from India went to Nepal, uh, which has long, you know, India has long considered as part of its so-called near abroad. So there's a sort of, the, the, the challenge from the Indian side is to take advantage of the commercial opportunities that China provides while ensuring that its own strategic space it does, is not further and further diminished as the economic gap between China and India grows. And that's the context in which to sort of view these debates about the deficit in India, the oh, right. China-India China, China, deficit. Shindo uh, you know, as we mentioned a moment ago, uh, the United States and China are locked in a trade war right now. So how important would it be for President Xi to expand the relationship with India? Well, I think it has um, not much to do with uh, the U.S.-China trade war. Of course, you know, people would say, you know, for Indian side, they would love to take advantage of this uh, trade conflicts between China and the, and the United States. For example, to sell more to China, their wheat or their soybean products, etc. Uh, that's a natural uh, reaction or response to the disputes between China and the, and the United States. But uh, when it comes to the China-India relationship, uh, it's really about this uh, bilateral uh, issue here. It's about a stable relationship between the two sides. Uh, the two countries are neighbors. They cannot change that. They will be neighbors permanently for the next thousands of years. So I think the two leaders basically try to uh, talk to each other that uh, to achieve um, a common understanding that is like, uh, you know, a better relationship between the two countries will benefit the two peoples and the two countries. And they cannot afford to have a, say, a poor relationship between the two countries. Uh, because for both countries, China and India, their top priority is really to develop their economy, to improve the living standards of their people, to create more jobs. So that requires a stable and a peaceful relationship in their neighborhood, including each other. Uh, so I think that's mostly uh, the goal uh, for China, and I think that's also the same for India. Musharraf Saidi, uh, as Sutherland pointed out at the beginning of the program, one of the key issues, one of the flashpoint issues really, that was not on the agenda was uh, Kashmir. Uh, China is very supportive of the Pakistani position and in fact claims part of Kashmir itself. Uh, does it surprise you that this was not on the agenda? No, not at all, because I think that China's approach to the Kashmir issue and its support for Pakistan is is directed towards Pakistan rather than against India. Uh, as you rightly noted, there's a part of Kashmir, uh, the Kashmir dispute that China itself is a stakeholder in. Uh, but ultimately, uh, 
China's relationship with India does not hinge either on Pakistan or on the Kashmir dispute. It hinges really on an interoperable trade relationship in which uh, the mutual dependencies that that trade relationship creates helps stabilize and secure China's interests uh, in its immediate neighborhood and uh, ideally beyond that as well. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, the Kashmir issue or China's relationship with Pakistan is instrumental or definitive in any way in terms of how it sees its relationship with India. And I think that unique ability that China has to separate out these different aspects of its uh, external policy, as James called it, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, is, is quite a big advantage to China because it allows it to continue to build up the stock of uh, trade capital that it has, uh, the trade surpluses that it has with countries not just like India and Pakistan, but uh, far far beyond those two countries as Can well. I, can I just quickly jump in? Um, I agree with everything that Musharraf says, but I think that the, the view from Delhi uh, is that the, the China-Pakistan relationship does end up complicating the China-India relationship. Now, we can argue about whether that should or should not happen, but the reality is that because the India-Pakistan relationship has become so politicized, uh, anything sort of, the, the, you know, the way the media in India covers these things and the way they look at it, for example, they paid a lot of attention to Imran Khan's visit to Beijing. Yeah. So I think that some of the, the atmospherics does spill over, even though I agree with Musharraf, the core of the India-China relationship is more to do with things like trade. And, and I think yeah. if, if I can add to that, that I, I think the other element here um, is that it, it's certainly true that the atmospherics between uh, India and China and, Indi and and Pakistan and China kind of affect each other. But the India-Pakistan relationship also affects China's ability to relate to either countries. Right. As, as an analyst looking at Beijing's policies, um, it's been pretty remarkable over the years that Beijing seems more sensitive to what the Indian Prime Minister says about Pakistan than the President of the United States. When we look at the action earlier this year um, against a, 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 in this UN Security Council against a, a terrorist leader based in Pakistan um, whom China had prevented from right. uh, facing international sanctions for eight years. Um, when ultimately what ca it came down to a high level of request from India and some backroom negotiations in New York. It didn't come down to the U.S.-China uh, relationship at all. Shindai what is your view on this? Yes, they did talk about the Kashmir uh, issue, obviously. Yeah. From China's point of view, uh, this is, you know, there's a principal issue that is like, uh, you know, the status quo is being altered. That's not good to the stability and the peace between uh, in this region and yeah. between India and, uh, and uh, uh, Pakistan. For China, if you want to really solve this problem, China encourages both India and Pakistan to engage in each other, to engage in dialogue. Yeah, Shinda, I just want to yeah, stop you. Know, you th yeah, Shinda, I just want to mm. stop you there because we do have yeah. uh, a comment from the Chinese Foreign Ministry. Uh, this is what the spokesman said on this issue. Let's watch this. We hope that India and Pakistan will step up dialogue on their disputes, including the Kashmir issue, so as to enhance mutual trust and improve relations. This serves the common interests of both India and Pakistan and is what the countries in the region and the international community expect. So how far is China prepared to go on this, Shindo? Just uh, you know, calling for dialogue or would China perhaps one day uh, facilitate talks between these two countries because India has consistently said that this th is an internal matter, an internal issue. That's right. That's right. It's uh, very difficult, uh, you know, for China to play a direct role to bring the two countries, uh, you know, to talk about their issues, including Kashmir, because India has made it very clear they don't accept uh, uh, outside uh, uh, mediation role from either China or the United States. Uh, so this is really between India and Pakistan. But from China's point of view, you know, like uh, if they can solve their problems, that would be the interest for Pakistan and India. I mean, everlasting interest for the two countries. They need to talk to each other. They need to solve their problems. Otherwise, both nations will suffer from this tension, either uh, mostly about Kashmir. So that's China's point of view, and China has made it very clear. When and the India, of course, you know, uh, changed the status quo in Kashmir. China has also made it clear, you know, China is not supportive of such action. China supports, uh, in a sense, the, you know, Pakistan's uh, grievance about, uh, you know, what happened in Kashmir. Uh, but ultimately, it's between India and uh, Pakistan.
Sutherland, I want to move back to something you talked about earlier, and that is uh, India facing pressure to join the uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the RCEP. Uh, that would create the world's largest trading bloc with 16 nations. And you think India is going to join that? I think from what I'm picking up, India yeah. is likely to join it if it can get some kind of special carve-out, uh, some kind of separate protocol that it signs with China. So what India faces is sort of it's a, it's a, it's a two-front issue. In terms of foreign policy, India needs to join RCEP because it fears that if it doesn't join RCEP, it'll be left out in the cold of, and it'll be left out of this very large influential economic grouping and it'll fall farther behind East Asia. But in terms of domestic politics, there's tremendous pressure in India to resist this because there's a worry that cheap Chinese manufactured goods, goods are going to flood in and, and, and contribute to a kind of deindustrialization of India. And so what Modi is trying to do, and this is something that he would have brought up with Xi Jinping, is to find a way that allows him to walk this line, get into RCEP because it serves one set of interests, yeah. but at the same time guard those sort of domestic constituencies. And I think that, 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 that uh, high wire act is something worth paying attention to. Right. James, how big a risk is it for India? Because there have been reports that uh, Indian membership of RCEP could result in a flood in the Indian market of cheap Chinese goods, uh, as which the, could actually widen the deficit. That, that, that's for sure. Although, yeah. I, as, as you pointed out earlier, when you described the current state of the China-India trade relationship, uh, India is already being flo flooded by cheap Chinese goods. Yeah. Um, and in fact, one of the unique tenets of India's uh, development story is that it's developed very quickly, but largely without the level of industrialization that you would expect in other large economic uh, cases around the world. Um, it's not, its case of modernization is not the same as China's industrialization-led approach or Europe's industrialization-led approach or the United States' uh, uh, approach uh, of 100 years ago. India's charting a unique uh, course in this regard. It, it's, it's had, that's part of the reason why mm -hmm. it defies some of the typical um, expectations and analysis. Um, and, and it's one of the, one of the, uh, the fixtures of this, uh, the, of this challenge that, uh, that Prime Minister Modi is dealing with. Um, when he thinks about uh, inter, uh, entering RCEP, or the, this uh, regional trade block, I think I, I would advise that they focus on two things. Um, one is you can't stop uh, China's uh, economic rise. You can't stop China's uh, role in your economy. China's going to be a tremendous trading partner for India uh, and for all of the uh, states of Asia. No matter what they do, uh, economics are, are in large part governed by proximity right. and resources, and China ha has both in this case. Um, what they can do is focus on the terms of that trade, the terms of their access to the Chinese market, and the terms of the, the labor environment and other rules that govern China's, uh, China's external trade uh, behavior to level the play playing field. China's uh, record as a trade partner, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very careful to not say free trade partner or fair trade partner. Mm -hmm. China's role as a, a, a trade partner all around the world um, has, been, has produced a race to the bottom when we look at labor wages, environmental records, um, and, and I think uh, you can look at uh, World Bank or Asian Development Bank or other ec uh, economic analysis that show this. The challenge for trading partners is to push China to improve its record faster than, the, than it is for its own self-interest. Look at, at the, the climate uh, environment mm -hmm. policy debate in China today, um, where the, because of public health concerns in China, they are right. changing their policies. Tr uh, trading partners need to develop scale yeah. to try to negotiate with China. Um, because of the U.S. trade policy environment, uh, currently the United States and China are pursuing bilateral negotiations without Europe, without India, with other, without other power centers. Yeah. India uh, could, in a block um, with China, push for, th for those enhancements, uh, much like the United States hoped to with the Trans-Pacific Partnership of the past. Okay. But it depends on Modi's decisions uh, going forward. I, I think joining RCEP would be a mistake yeah. uh, in that objective. I want to get a quick response from Shindo Shu on what James just said. Uh, does China see its trade relationship around the world in the same way as a race to the bottom, Shindo? Well, I, I don't see China as any different from other uh, countries in mm -hmm. doing trade. It's really about the developing, development stage. Yeah. You know, uh, for example, China and India both consider themselves as okay. the large developing countries. And uh, you know, for India, like in, including RCEP, they ask for some protection for certain industries. I think China has already agreed to that. You know, basically, the delay for several years to implement those policies and RCEP. 
for China, that's not a big problem. China understand that uh, India yeah. for uh, they do need uh, some time to catch up with China or to develop a certain industry okay. in order to become more competitive. That's no problem for China. Uh, Musharraf Saidi, I want to talk about uh, China's other big foray into South Asia, its other big economic involvement, and that is CPEC, the uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Uh, it was launched in 2015. That was when Nawaz Sharif was prime minister in Pakistan. Is there still much enthusiasm in Pakistan, or does it, as some analysts contend, give China too much say in, in Pakistan's affairs? Yeah, I think... Uh, uh, the, the degree to which uh, China has a say in Pakistan's affairs is vastly overstated, uh, at least as far as CPEC is concerned. However, the importance of uh, Pakistan's role in BRI and, more importantly, the importance of BRI or CPEC in, in Pakistan's economic present and its future uh, is indisputable. The entirety of the turnaround in the uh, power supply and electricity grid in Pakistan that has been enacted since 2015 uh, has been built entirely on the back of uh, CPEC. The massive investments in uh, road infrastructure that, have, uh, that are now beginning to come to fruition, uh, and in fact there's some questions about the delays that are not operational but actually political, with the current prime minister being concerned that the credit for having built these roads may go, uh, obviously China will get a big, uh, a big yeah. share of the credit, but the rest of the bulk of the credit may go to the previous prime minister, his, his opponent. Uh, yeah. so, so I think, you know, to that extent, CPEC and BRI are, are central to where Pakistan is today and, and will continue to be in terms of big investors in right. Pakistan. China continues to be uh, the biggest among them. I also think that CPEC offers an interesting case study potentially for the future as to how China is able to negotiate its relationship with India, which it values, and mm -hmm. its relationship with, uh, with, uh, with Pakistan. Uh, you know, we were speaking earlier about kind of a zero-sum game, that if it's close to India, it, does that mean that China is giving up on Kashmir or giving up on Pakistan? That's, I, I don't see that uh, in any way as being uh, the, the facts of the case. The facts of the case are that when push comes to shove internationally, China is always going to stand by Pakistan. But as far as helping Pakistan and India come closer together, China will not ruin its relationship with India or press India to the point where that relationship might get ruined. All the while, what it's trying to create is an ecosystem that, that privileges economic coordination and integration, and it's doing that by helping supply the, the actual physical infrastructure that will help forge that integration, not just between Pakistan and India, which I think is further down the road, if at all possible, yep. but certainly between Pakistan and Afghanistan and Pakistan and many of the Central Asian right. countries that border Afghanistan. So I think China's thinking about this in a, in a typically Chinese way, yeah. and I think if we approach this from a kind of binary, uh, you know, or yep. zero-sum approach, then, then it's hard for us to understand okay. what China is actually doing here. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching. Hello everybody, I'm Arnand Naidu. If you enjoy the thoughtful, engaged discussions you see on The Heat, you may also want to subscribe to our podcast. It's appropriately titled The Heat. Twice a week we take a deep dive on world headlines, talking to experts, journalists and others. It's a fresh, focused and intimate look at the issues that matter most. Whether it's the Hong Kong riots, the latest Middle East conflict or US politics, The Heat podcast gives the clear context needed to understand both what's going on and why. And what's best, we come to you. Whether you're at home or on the go, you can find The Heat Podcast just about anywhere podcasts are found. Just search The Heat CGTN. Have a listen today and subscribe. Thanks.